So today <clears throat> we will continue talking about chemical potential. So we will, so today's agenda is we'll try to get some intuition into chemical potential. Most importantly, we will try to see why is it called potential? Normally, when you think about potential, you have electric potential or gravitational potential. Potential tends to represent a direction, either in which you have resistance or in which you have flow. So what is mu? What does it have to do with potential for a chemical? That's something we will talk about. After that, we will again talk about Gibbs phase rule. We saw it last time. Once we have seen, once we have gotten some intuition into chemical potential, we will be able to talk a bit better about what is Gibbs phase rule, where does it come from? There is a full proof of Gibbs phase rule. I won't do the full proof. I will do the proof only for a single component system. <coughs> and, uh, and time permitting, <coughs> sorry, we will talk about how to characterize phase boundaries. <coughs> sorry about that. <clears throat> I, I don't have COVID. I just bite too fast and drank some cold water. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's try to gain some intuition into what is chemical potential. In order to do this, let's imagine some block of material or some two chemicals that exist in the following form. You have phase alpha on the you have phase alpha on the left and you have phase beta on the right, okay? You have two different phases. And let's say both of these phases are made up of species one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. And this one also has species one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. So the blue, this is the phase, phase alpha, phase beta, and one, two, three denote our species. So what does it mean, for example? Phase alpha could be <coughs> uh, solid, it could be ice where you have water mixed with some contaminants, phase beta. So for example, alpha could be solid ice with some salt in it, okay? As it happens on the road, for example, when they will be spraying salt. And beta could be liquid water with NaCl. So in this case, our species would be H2O, it could be H3O plus and OH minus, if you care about that, it would be NaCl, so on and so forth, okay? So we have two phases that are existing next to each other. <clears throat> and let's say alpha and beta are in equilibrium. Specifically, so we have talked about mechanical equilibrium. Anyone remembers what is mechanical equilibrium when we drew two boxes like this? What is it that had to be equal for mechanical equilibrium? Go ahead. Pressure. And how about thermal equilibrium? Anyone remembers on the back? Temperature, right? So for <clears throat> now we are talking about chemical equilibrium. And we do know that in general, be it pressure equilibrium, be it, be it mechanical equilibrium, be it temperature equilibrium, be it chemical equilibrium, there is one quantity that captures it all. That is Gibbs free energy, right? That is why DG is so important. You can see DG talks about VDP, DG talks about DT, it also talks about summation mu i d n i, right? DG takes care of change in pressure, change in temperature, and change in number of species. It really sees how everything is behaving. So for this, this alpha and beta phases to be in chemical equilibrium at constant temperature and pressure. This is our setup. So these two things that are existing here are at constant temperature and pressure. We are not going to worry about what happens if temperature and pressure change. We know then they come to equilibrium to get the same pressure. We know about that, but let's think about it. You have two phases with same species, but in different amounts, what's going to happen next? So, so now let's imagine a thought experiment. Let's imagine we transfer 
dn1 small amount moles of species 1 from phase alpha to phase beta at constant temperature and pressure. So we took dn1 out of dn1 is some positive quantity. We took it out of phase alpha and we moved it to phase beta. So for this change, for this transfer to be reversible, because if you know if, it, if these two things are in equilibrium, then the process of taking dn1 from alpha and going to beta should be spontaneous. And also the process of going taking DN, dn1 from beta to alpha should also be spontaneous, right? So for this transfer, to be reversible or under equilibrium, dg for this change should be equal to zero, okay? dg should be equal to zero. Now, if you look at equation one, we have already said constant P and constant P, right? So the, it's the third term that will matter. But before we use equation one, dg is equal to zero can be written as that the change in free energy of phase alpha plus the change in free energy of phase beta must be equal to zero. If alpha's free energy has gone down, then beta's free energy must have gone up. If alpha's free energy has gone up, beta's free energy must have gone down. We don't know about the sign yet. That depends on other things. But this equation must be true for equilibrium to be present, okay? So, I will write it down over here again. So equation two was dg alpha plus dg beta is equal to zero. Now notice that dg itself from equation one is zero plus zero because VDP and SDT, the first two terms are zero, right? You're doing constant pressure and constant temperature plus summation mu i dni. But we have transferred only species one, dn2, dn3, dn4, dn5, they are all zero. So in this case, dn2 equal to dn3 is equal to dn4. These things are all zero. The only thing that has changed is species one. So what can we say about dg alpha then? It will be mu one multiplied by dn1, right? However, this mu one is in phase alpha. So <clears throat> for those of you who came after I started, we are doing something very simple. We have, just like we talked about pressure and temperature equilibrium, we had two things existing and we said, kinetic energy will move until the pressure becomes constant. The wall will move until the pressure becomes constant or kinetic energy will transfer until temperature becomes constant. Here we are talking about two species that are existing in phase alpha. Lots of species in phase alpha, lots of species in phase beta. And we took a little bit of one species, let's say only number one, and took it from alpha to beta. And we are saying this is an equilibrium process. This means dg must be equal to zero. And this is at constant pressure and temperature. So this is zero, this is zero. So that remains only mu i dni. On top of that, dn2, dn3, dn4 are all zero. So dg alpha is mu one alpha d1, the chemical potential of one in phase alpha multiplied by d1. What can we say about dg beta? Or actually, if you think about it, did I write dg alpha correct? Or did I miss something? It should be negative, exactly. So what should be dg beta? It should be positive, but now we will have mu one beta. And here it will still be dn one because we know the same amount, it has been taken from alpha and been given to beta. And so the reason, you're Naveen, right? The reason why Naveen says this is negative is because we have said dn one more than zero, okay? And you took it out of phase alpha. So what can we say about dg? dg is equal to minus mu one alpha dn one plus mu one beta dn one is equal to mu one beta minus mu one alpha dn one. But at equilibrium, dg is equal to dg alpha plus dg beta should be equal to zero. 
Therefore, we know that mu1 beta minus mu1 alpha multiplied by dn1 is equal to zero at equilibrium. And this has to be true for any dn1, right? There is nothing special about dn1. So the only way this can happen, on top of that, we have said dn1 is more than zero, right? So the only way this equation can be zero is if mu1 alpha equal to mu1 beta. So we just learned something very interesting and simple is at equilibrium, the chemical potential of any species must be equal in all different phases. Therefore, chemical potential of any species must be the same in two phases that are in equilibrium. If you came late and missed out or are feeling lost in the derivation, that's okay. You can go and look it up later, but remember this statement, just like in mechanical equilibrium, pressure must be same. In thermal equilibrium, temperature must be same. For chemical equilibrium, chemical potential must be same. And here we did it for species one, but there is nothing special about it, right? We could have moved species two. It could have applied to anyone. It would be mu one alpha is equal to mu one beta, mu two alpha is equal to mu two beta, so on and so forth. Notice we are not saying anything about how mu one alpha compares to mu, mu two alpha, right? We are not saying what is the chemical potential of different species in the same phase. We are talking about chemical potential of same species in different phases, okay? Is that clear? If it is truly like the potential, then we expect something else. In electricity, when we think about potential, charge moves in a certain direction, right? High potential to no potential, or low potential or whatever, depending on the sign of the charge. Same in gravity. If if you hang me from there and just leave me, I will drop down over here, right? I move in a certain direction. So does the same apply to chemical potential? So we go back to the same block that we drew. And uh, again, we have phase alpha here and we have phase beta. So we just showed that if mu one alpha is equal to mu one beta, there is equilibrium. What does equilibrium mean? It does not mean that species one is not diffusing across the boundary to the other side and coming back from here to this side. Later, after Thanksgiving, we will study about chemical kinetics. So a little bit, we will talk about something called fixed law of diffusion, which is a lot of fun. We will, we will talk about something called the drunk, drunk gambler problem, which is very interesting. It is, yeah, it is, we will see some fun things about how things move. But the point about equilibrium, equilibrium does not mean things are not moving. Equilibrium means they are balanced out. So the number of one that is crossing the boundary and going into the other phase is the same as the number of one that is the crossing the boundary and coming back into the first phase, right? So equilibrium does not mean, you know, build a wall, close border. Equilibrium is balanced. Everything is going back and forth in, in, in the same amount. On net, you do not detect any motion. So, and this is something to keep in mind. Equilibrium is not equal to death. Equilibrium does not mean everything has stopped moving. Things are still moving, but they are in balance. Now the question is, what if mu one alpha was more than mu one beta? What would happen then? Where would species one move? Would it move from alpha to beta? Or would it move from beta to alpha? Any ideas? So it will move from Species one moves from alpha to beta net. What do I mean by net? It does not mean one is not moving from beta to alpha, but overall more of it is going from alpha to beta. Let's try to see this. Let's think intuitively this should be clear, but let's try to see how we prove it mathematically. So, <clears throat> we are talking about mu one alpha more than mu one beta, okay? So this can be written as zero more than 
mu one beta minus mu one alpha, right? I just move the mu one alpha to the other side, or minus mu one alpha plus mu one beta less than zero, right? I haven't done anything profound. I, I can't get the Nobel Prize for this. It's just two lines of algebra. Now let's consider again dn1 positive, okay? Let's say if dn1 was positive, what does this mean? This means alpha losing dn1 amount, right? That's what dn1 positive means. We take it out of the phase alpha. Now let's calculate our dg and see whether it is negative or positive. If it is negative, then we mean this is the spontaneous direction. And this thing that I wrote over here makes sense. So let's, let's work through it. So this proof, again, it's a bit, it's mathematical, it's a bit confusing, but the key message of this proof is things move from higher potential to lower potential. This is something you always know about gravity, about electricity, there's nothing profound, but I'm just working through it mathematically. So if dn1 is more than zero, uh, what's our equation number? Let's call it equation four. Multiply four by dn1 both sides, okay? dn1 is positive. And if you multiply this thing by dn1 both sides, the sign of the inequality will not change. So you will have minus mu1 alpha dn1 plus mu1 beta dn1 is still negative, right? Or mu1 alpha minus dn1 plus mu1 beta plus dn1 is negative or dg is negative. So I have just shown something simple in, in a slightly rigorous way. And what do we know about dg negative at constant temperature and pressure? So this is all at constant temperature and pressure. This, this, this will not apply if you were changing temperature and pressure. If you were changing temperature and pressure, then you would have competition between, between the first two terms that play a role in dg. So if dg is negative, therefore, alpha losing dn1 moles is spontaneous. Therefore, we just showed that species one moves from, therefore things move from higher chemical potential to lower chemical potential. This is the big message over here. This is the big physical idea. You can design a battery based on this principle. That's the whole idea, how charge will move. You know, you have to account for electric potential, but also chemical potential when you design a battery. The thing here is this is true only at constant temperature and pressure. Why is this not true at con variable temperature and pressure? Go ahead. Yeah, so at we know we in order to do this, we calculated dg and dg is vdp minus sdt plus mu i dni, right? So we were able to ignore these two at constant temperature and pressure. If we did not have constant temperature and pressure, we would have to worry about those two. So go ahead. Is this related to the second law of thermodynamics? Yeah, this is just a restatement of second law of thermodynamics. So you can think of it as I mean, the last second law of Andrew's statement, right? So we can call this one Naveen's statement of second law of thermodynamics, okay? It's okay, you will all get confused. You'll be like, who was Naveen? You'll go on Wikipedia. And then you'll be like, I don't find this Naveen. Yeah, let's just stay with Andrew's. Good? Okay. So this is equivalent to second law of thermodynamics. There is nothing, yeah. Uh, is, is this clear? So what, what have we learned so far? At chemical, under chemical equilibrium, the chemical potential is constant for the same species across different phases. You have solid ice and you have, you have, you have solid solution of salt in water, which is ice, and you have liquid solution of salt in water, which is liquid water. So NaCl, sodium chloride's chemical potential will be equal between the solid and the liquid. 
water's chemical potential will be equal between the ice and the water, you know, or with, and the water solution. So it's this different species which whose chemical potential is same. It doesn't say anything about what is the chemical potential of sodium chloride with respect to water in the solid ice. We are not talking about that. We are talking about different phases. Okay. <clears throat> So now we are ready to prove Gibbs phase rule. Go ahead. So just explain that as long as our chemical potentials are different, any change in molar amount on the ice will be spontaneous. Yeah. Even if the chemical potential is just ever so slightly outside of it. Yeah. It'll keep moving. Then you have to worry about Gibbs phase. Then that's when the Gibbs Duhem equation comes into work. Gibbs Duhem equation talks about mu i d and i. Remember? So then you, that will tell you how far do you move. We are, we are not filling that whole picture, but let's, let's just see what we can do with this. So now we are ready for Gibbs phase rule, just to refresh your memories. We did it last time. F is equal to C minus P plus two. This was number of components. By the way, Gibbs is considered by many people as the father of thermodynamics. Somehow Einstein's name is very famous. I guess Einstein, you know, is very popular in science and uh, in popular in real life, right? Yes, everyone, if some, if even your relatives would probably know Einstein, my relatives at least know them, him. But if I ask them, do you know who is Gibbs? They go like, who? No one knows Gibbs, but Gibbs contribution to science, modern science is Einstein himself said it's as, as big as his. Because, you know, thermodynamics is so fundamental. So this is number of components. Uh, this is number of phases. And this is degrees of freedom. How many parameters? So degrees of freedom, and we did this last time, so I won't write it down, I'll just speak it. Degrees of freedom is how many things that can be independently varied in a system. Okay, how many in quantities can you change independently? Number of components was number of species minus constraints. Chemical equilibrium, charge constraint, and things like that, right? So, and I told you that for any problem, I will tell you the number of components. I will not have you try to figure out how many components are there. It becomes a bit messy for no reason due to just bookkeeping. And number of phases are well, as I said, number of phases. Do you have solid and liquid would be two phases. Solid itself could be in different crystal forms and you will have more than two phases. Gibbs phase rule says that these things must be related in this form. And now we can try to prove this using this notion of chemical <clears throat> equilibrium. So Gibbs phase rule is something that can be proved in different levels of abstraction. In uh, uh, in the graduate thermodynamics class, which I'll probably be teaching next fall, CHEM 684, I'll probably prove it in a very, very abstract and rigorous level. Today, we are just going to look at it at a specific part of the proof. We are going to look only for the case of a one component system, C is equal to one, okay? If you want to study proof for C more than one, Atkins has the proof. So what we are going to do here, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. You're really going before, before. <laughs> no, no, this is different. This is different. This is degrees of freedom on a phase diagram. This, this tells us whether a solid will be along a line or whether a solid will be in an area, things like that. So it's different from that one. Yeah, that's. That's a, good, that's a bit confusing. So, okay. So the proof for multi-component system is given in Atkins, you can go and read it. Last time I did it, and then the next week, I mean, a lot of, half the class was like totally depressed about the proof because it became just, I mean, yeah, I, I can share it, but it's, it's nothing profound. It's just setting up some linear equations and looking at it, and I think it, it distracts us from doing more physical chemistry. So let's, this proof you can read in Atkins. We will just do it for C is equal to one. So we have 
a one component system and we want to prove Gibbs phase rule for a one component system. So what do we want to prove? We want to prove that F is equal to one minus P plus two, right? For a one component system, this is what we want to prove that F is equal to three minus P. How do we prove this? Let's start one by one. Let's say, well, okay. How about if we had only one phase? So one phase in one component system. So water, so let's, let's look at it. For example, water in liquid form. So the degrees of freedom for this system are pressure and temperature, both can be varied independently, right? And this independently is the key thing over here. So let's say I have water over here. It's not dissociating into anything. It's just pure water. I can heat it up, right? I can heat it to let's say uh, 80 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Celsius. At the same time, I can keep tightening the cap and increasing the pressure as much as I want, right? These two things can be varied independently. If it is only one phase liquid water, therefore F is equal to two because both of them can be varied independently. So does it follow our Gibbs phase rule? Two is the same as three minus one is equal to three minus P because we had only one phase. So for one phase in a one component system, Gibbs phase rule, you didn't even have to prove anything. It's almost trivially followed, right? F is indeed equal to three minus P. Now let's think about two phases in one component system. So P is equal to two, and we want to prove F is equal to three minus P is equal to one. So for two phases in one component system, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> it is still water, but now there is uh, liquid water and solid ice existing in equilibrium with each other. And now I'm telling you that I cannot change the temperature of the system and the pressure of the system independently. Anytime I set the temperature, it's going to tell me what is the pressure. This is not trivial if you think about it. Why should this be true? Go ahead. Yeah, so it's there are many ways of looking at it, and essentially they all follow from second law of thermodynamics. The way we will look at it is to think about our chemical issue. Okay, so we have a one component system. So let's say these phases are alpha and beta, and we have only one component, right? So we don't need to worry about mu one, mu two, it's just mu. So what can we say about the chemical potential now if they, it's in equilibrium in the two phases? It should be equal in phase alpha and it should be equal in phase beta. But what is chemical potential a function of? Chemical potential itself is a function of pressure and temperature. Chemical potential is not a path quantity. It is a state function. It is going to depend on pressure and temperature, okay? So what we have just done here, so it could depend, you know, it could look, for example, it could look something like, let, let me go to the next page and then write it clearly. So I just said that two phases in one component system at equilibrium, mu in phase alpha should be equal to mu in phase beta for that component. Here, I don't need to write mu one alpha, mu two alpha, because there is only one component. And on top of that, I'm saying that mu is a function of pressure and temperature. Mu is something that depends on pressure and temperature, right? Why should it depend on pressure and temperature? Remember how we 
wrote G. What, is, what are natural variables for G? Pressure, temperature, and number. And here we are not varying number, right? It's one component system. So the mole fractions are not changing. So G is equal to G of pressure temperature at for one component. And remember the connection between G and mu? G mu is G per mole for one component. Where does this come from? This comes from, we wrote G is equal to summation, G i bar N i, right? The partial molar volume where G i bar was mu i. So for a multi-component system, this in Atkins, you will not find this level of detail going into why is mu a pressure function of pressure and temperature. They just kind of throw it out. And if you read it again, I at least got confused. I said, why should mu be a function of pressure and temperature? So I'm going to go hopefully give you intuition here. So in a multi-component system, G is equal to mu one N one plus mu two N two plus dot, dot, dot. In one component system, G is equal to mu one N one or mu one is equal to G by N one number of moles mu in a one component system is nothing but the Gibbs free energy per mole. And since G depends on pressure and temperature, therefore mu depends on pressure or temperature, which brings us back to this. So I can call all of this as an aside to hopefully give you intuition into why is mu a function of pressure and temperature. But now that mu is a function of pressure and temperature, what do I mean by calling something as a function of pressure and temperature? It means that it can be written as something that looks like, I don't know, P square plus temperature multiplied by pressure. I'm just writing a function out of my head. You know, this is equal to P square plus P cube minus temperature pressure, just two functions on the other side. But anytime, the idea here is that anytime you have a relation connecting two variables. So in this case, you have an equation that connects these two variables. You have a constraint on these two variables, right? So if I give you the value of pressure over here, you can go and plug it in here and solve for temperature, right? That's the whole idea. Therefore, let's call this as, did I miss equation four? Let's call this equation four. Therefore, so equation four implies there is a constraint connecting pressure and temperature. Anytime you know pressure, you can go and solve for pressure. Anytime you know temperature, you can go and solve for pressure. In order to do this, you will have to know why, how does mu depend on pressure and temperature, but that's not the point here. The point here is that they will be connected. If you had pressure temperature space like this, you won't be able to go anywhere. There will be some curve that will dictate that any given value of pressure, what value of temperature can you take, okay? Actually, there is something wrong about this curve. Anyone sees why? Someone who likes calculus a lot? <laughs> it's not one to one. So this value of pressure, you can actually take two temperatures. So this is a bad example. Let's just stick with this curve. That, that leads to some other issues. But you, know, you have a connection between pressure and temperature. Let's just stop at that. So you have a constraint. Go ahead. But there is a function. No, but if they're the same, it's a pretty good variable zero. Yeah. But then they are not two different phases. That's not true. That's a good question. I would think so, but I need to think of. <laughs> if I I think they would be the same phases. If the chemical potential is exactly the same, you won't be able to differentiate it, right? That's the whole point about phase. So, but that's that's remind me, that's that's a good point. Yeah, so he's saying that if the functions themselves were the same, then you don't have constraint. And you're just saying P plus T is equal to P plus T, which will of course be followed for any P or T, right? So that could be a contradiction. So 
let's not let's let's ignore that for a bit. So we have a constraint. This means knowing pressure, we can not vary temperature independently. Knowing temperature, we can not vary pressure independently. So how many degrees of freedom do we have now? Did I lose everyone except Ryan and maybe a few people have gone for this, please? Go ahead, Stella. Why? Only one, there is one constraint. So in the previous case, we had pressure and temperature varying independently. Now we have a constraint, so it got reduced to one. Good. I have no Snickers today. <laughs> so therefore, F is equal to one. And that's what we wanted to prove, right? We wanted to prove that F is equal to three minus P. In this case, we had a two phase system. So one is equal to three minus two is equal to three minus P. So for a two phase, one component system also we have proven Gibbs phase rule. We already did it for one phase, one component system. Let's go one step further. Let's think about three phases, one component. So alpha, beta, gamma. So in this case, what will we have? We will have mu alpha as a function of pressure and temperature is equal to mu beta as a function of pressure and temperature. What else should we have? Someone from the Cosmo, you're seeing very silent. What other equation should we have? So how many constraints do we have now? Three or two? This is a tricky one, that two equal two signs, right? So even though we have three functions, there are only two equations, right? So you could think about this and say, this means mu alpha is equal to mu beta, mu beta is equal to mu gamma, and mu alpha is equal to mu gamma. That would feel like you have three equations. But the point remains that as soon as you have written mu alpha is equal to mu beta, mu is equal to mu beta, gamma, this one is redundant, right? It doesn't matter. So you have two equations. Let's go back to Stella. How many constraints do we have now? So earlier we said that knowing pressure, we could solve for temperature because we had one equation connecting them. Now pay attention. We have two variables, pressure and temperature, and two equations connecting them. What does this tell us? No, yeah, two constraints. So what does it tell us about value of pressure and temperature? There will be one unique value, right? So this is, if you remember on the algebra, anytime we say 5x plus 3y, let's talk about pressure. For example, we have a relation 5p plus 3t is equal to 5. In the pressure temperature phase diagram, this is a straight line, right? But on top of that, if I say I have one more equation, which is 3p plus 7p is equal to 4. Now there is another line, right? And the only possible solution is where these two lines intersect. Sometimes you might not have a solution, right? Your dream is simply not possible. You will have things like that also, right? But the point being that uh, now you can no longer vary even one of them. Number of degrees of two equations in two variables means nothing can be varied and number of degrees of freedom is zero. So does this follow Gibbs phase rule? How? Huh? What did we want to show? Gibbs phase rule was F is equal to C minus P plus two. Component is one, so one minus P plus two. So we want to show F is equal to three minus P. And we had three phases, therefore F is equal to zero. So indeed it follows Gibbs phase rule. Let's go one step further. Can four phases exist in a one component system? Why or why not? Corina, what do you think? You will get negative rate of freedom and that means nothing, you know? That's, that's crap. Four phase component system cannot exist. This could be a very nice final exam problem, right? Prove this, I will just write a sentence and if you have been through the class, if you're here, hopefully it will be very easy for you. All you have to do is to show that this would mean mu alpha is equal to mu beta is equal to mu gamma is equal to mu delta. So one, two, three two variables, pressure and temperature, and three equations. Can you solve two variables in three equations? 
maybe if two of the equations are same, then you might get a special solution, but they are probably the same phase then, right? So in general, you don't have a solution. So four phases in one component cannot exist because then F will be equal to minus one. So one thing I wanna point out, Gibbs phase rule in certain books, in certain places, you will see it in the form of F is equal to C minus P plus one. And that's depending on how they treat their pressure and temperature. So it gets confusing sometimes. I would stick with F is equal to C minus P plus two where pressure and temperature are both considered as independent variables. Any questions? Go ahead. According to your examples, we can say there are two lines that need to right? Yeah. So three, basically, we three lines that need to right? Seen in one of the things that are So they quick sentences. That would be a very special case though. Okay. Right, I mean, let's think about it. So two lines are meeting here. Yeah. Now if I have to draw a third line, Where's the big chart? Here it is. <laughs> so we know two lines will always meet at a point unless they are parallel, right? A third line would look like this, right? So you're really forcing a third line to go. You're putting more constraints on the third line. And generally it won't happen. But it could happen, right? It could, it could, it could. You have come up with a good list of things that could happen. You, you need to write it down and send to me and have a thing through them, okay? But as hopefully you agree that it's gonna be a special case, right? It tells us in fact something about where the third line must go through the origin and we don't, okay? So this is our Gibbs phase rule. Now, yeah, go ahead. So here I drew the straight line just to give you a sense. And uh, I don't want to worry about how many points they intersect with. I want to think about equations as constraints. Now, of course, you can go more mathematical into this. And if mu is nonlinear, there could be more complications, but hopefully this is giving you a flavor. That's why I said it, it becomes complicated. If you want to get more into the proof for Gibbs phase rule, it can get more and more rigorous. For example, I did not do multiple component system here. If you look up Atkins for multi-component system, it does not just have equations like this, he also needs to talk about different components. So he has another rows of equations and then it becomes more complex. If you have nonlinear equations, further complication, right? So, but the key point here is, hopefully you got the flavor for this. Be, anytime you add a constraint, connect chemical potential being equal is a constraint and chemical potential is a function of pressure and temperature, which reduces how you can vary pressure and temperature independently, which in turn reduces the number of degrees of freedom. So look at the relation over here. F is equal to C minus P plus two. What is the key idea here? As you increase the number of phases, F has a negative sign, right? F is minus P. As you increase the number of phases, the number of degrees of freedom go down. And why does this happen? Because anytime you increase the number of phases, under equilibrium, you are adding more constraints. You're telling every species you must be the same in chemical equilibrium, right? So that brings down, this, this is the big picture over here. Now, however, this big picture is uh, very useful. So I, will, I won't do phase boundary today, we will start that next time, but I'm gonna draw a simple phase diagram. And I want you to tell me I will, which part of this is uh, wrong, okay? So here is a pressure temperature phase diagram for a one component system, okay? And I will draw, some arbitrary phase boundary. And let's say this is phase alpha, this is phase beta, this is phase delta, this is phase gamma, this is phase epsilon, okay? This is the phase diagram for one component element called pacorium. That's Pakora. Okay, so what, so first of all, what would happen here? What phase would exist along this line? Huh? Alpha plus delta, right? It is at the boundary between alpha and delta. How about this line? Beta plus delta. How about this point? Alpha plus beta plus delta. How about this point? 
beta plus gamma plus delta plus epsilon. But is that possible? Could you have a point like this? Why not? We have number of, this means you have zero degrees of freedom. You have a point. This is not possible. So on the basis of Gibbs phase rule, you can already look at the phase diagram and say, this looks funky. There is some mistake over here, but this one, for example, we have P is equal to three, C is equal to one. So F is equal to C minus P plus two is equal to one minus three plus two is equal to zero. And that makes sense. Three phases are existing at a point. If you look at the boundary between two phases, F is equal, C is equal to one, P is equal to two. Therefore, F is equal to one minus two plus two is equal to one, which means you can vary pressure, but anytime you vary the pressure, you know what is the temperature. So every phase diagram has to conform to Gibbs phase rule, okay? So next time what we are going to do is to really think about the equation of this curve. What decides how does pressure vary with temperature and that will be the Clapeyron equation.